I want you to leap ahead in your mind for a moment to the year 2050 as a financial brand leader. What do you see when you think about a future that is going to be here in less than 30 years? How does what you see impact your bank, your credit, and even your fintech right now in the present moment? Now, if you're thinking that the year 2050 is some far-off futuristic period, consider this for a moment. It was just 30 years ago that the internet reached the mass consciousness of humanity would transform the way that we would shop, that we would connect, engage with each other, and the way that we bank. Now, go back to the year 2050 for a moment. Does the future in your mind, does it feel even bigger? Does it feel even better? Does it feel even brighter than what it does today? Or does the future feel a little confusing, a little complex, even maybe a little chaotic? Furthermore, where might there be untapped opportunities, even unknown opportunities for future growth opportunities that can come by helping entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in the communities that your financial brand serves to continue to level up their businesses to create an even bigger future for the people that they're helping. Well, let's find out together on today's episode of the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. Greetings and hello, my name is James Robert Lay, and I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Banking on Digital Growth Podcast. Today's episode is part of the Exponential Insight Series, and joining me for today's conversation is Dan Sullivan. Dan is the co-founder and president of Strategic Coach, and today, Dan and I are going to be discussing his new book, The Great Meltdown, to help you unlock new future growth opportunities as a financial brand leader by looking for ways that you can help entrepreneurial leaders in the communities that you serve continue to level up their business to the year 2050. Welcome to the show, Dan. It is always good share, to share time with you today, buddy. Thank you, Robert, um, James Robert. And uh, yeah, uh, interesting world. And uh, uh, you have a lot of things to talk about. I have a lot of things to talk about. We do. And before we get into what I see as maybe one of the biggest A, unknown and B, untapped growth opportunities for financial brands, particularly financial brands here in the United States, helping entrepreneurial leaders level up their business. What is good for you right now? What's 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 positive in the world of Dan? <clears throat> well, uh, our company is doing really well. We had our best revenue year, great profits, not the greatest percentage profits, but probably the biggest actual profits. And um, uh, it's going really well. We had three best-selling books that are giving us great pre-qualified leads for the program. Uh, we'll cross a thousand new um, uh, registrations into Coach this year, so that's good. That's awesome. And, and uh, <clears throat> we're in a big move right now to get our uh, all of our thinking tools patented. So we. We have right now, we have about 60 patents in. We've gotten nine back from the Patent Bureau in the last um, last eight months. And uh, these have value. And that would be a totally different podcast to talk about the asset value of pat patents and the fact that you can borrow against your patent assets. I think that's uh, a, so that, that would be a good future conversation because when we think about this evol evolving world of, of banking and financial <clears throat> services. Uh, you've even said before, what is the value of the S and P 500 now with IP versus a physical asset? How has that changed over the past couple, what decade? 40 years. It's uh, it was 2080, 20, 20% 20 uh, IP assets, 80% tangible assets, which would be property and buildings and equipment, everything that's, you know, that's got, weight and mass and uh now it's just reversed it's yeah. uh 80 80 percent uh and if you look at the the really top ones like apple and uh you know the other tech giants uh it would be well over 90 might be 95 percent their valuation is based on uh intellectual property which is considered uh uh an intangible Right. And you think about where we're going now, where we've been, where we're at and where we're headed. This is where you wrote a fantastic new book titled The Great Meltdown, and it explores the four crucial factors 
that determine economic growth, MELT being an acronym, money, energy, labor, uh, transportation. What I'm most excited about this book is it provides a perspective that I would say is of hope, of, of optimism. Um, <laughs> and, and I know many financial brand leaders uh, are feeling a little different than that right now in what are otherwise confusing and complex times. But it's a good book for financial brand leaders because it taps into to growth opportunities that are rooted in helping innovators, entrepreneurs, especially those in the United States continue to grow, to continue to level up their businesses, because it's going to be these innovative entrepreneurs, as, as you share, that lead mm -hmm. the way. Why, why write The Great Meltdown and why now? Well, uh, <clears throat> it has something. Uh, there's a number of factors. When I was born, and uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm uh, actually pre. I predate the boomers. So, boomers were born in earliest boomers were born in 1946, and I was born in 1944. And um, so, I've lived my entire life in the present world. And by present world, I mean the world that followed the Second World War, okay? And that was a war that was based, that uh, world order, and uh, um, this is not my original thinking here. This is Peter Zion, who is a very, very original thinker. And uh, But he talks about the deal that the U.S. put together with uh, willing partners uh, after the Second World War that basically had three pillars to it. Number one is the U.S. dollar would be the reserve currency because there was no other currency that could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, the secondly was that the U.S. would, it uh, was half the world economy. Uh, the U.S. was the global GDP. The U.S. was half of the GB GDP because so many other countries had gone bankrupt and failed because of the war. And uh, and so the U.S. would uh, uh, bar, uh, lend massively amounts of money. The central th the central thing there was the Marshall Plan in Europe, which rebuilt the European countries, uh, those who wanted to be part of it. And uh, the other thing was that the U.S. would protect all trade routes, so people could make whatever they wanted to make, and they could sell it into the U.S. without any tariffs. Okay, that was not a economic uh, plan. That was a strategic plan because the U.S. could see that if there was another war in Europe and they had to fight it against the Soviet Union, they couldn't win. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, besides, too many taxpayers came back in coffins. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Americans don't like losing taxpayers. Right. <laughs> Right. And, and so, uh, yeah, so they did this deal, and it was a great deal. And uh, but it, uh, it was the only purpose was to offset the Soviet Union, which in nineteen ninety two in nineteen ninety two quit. They did. They just they just folded as a entity. And but the deal was so good for everybody else that everybody else just went going on as if the deal was going to last forever, but it wasn't that great economically for the U.S. And starting five presidents, uh, starting with Clinton and then uh, Bush and then Obama and then Trump and uh, Biden, we've been pulling back. And uh, the biggest thing we pulled back uh, is two fronts. We don't do multi multilateral uh, uh, trade agreements, so starting with Trump. We just we reworked all of our trade agreements just bipolar. It's just us and you, and the deal has to be good for us, you know. And uh, so all the reasons for the, uh, the um, United States actually, um, you know, allowing things to happen then have stopped. And uh, you know, and so they said, "Look, well, let's the the deal is essentially over, but the rest of the world likes the deal," and. Uh, but the U.S. says, and we're not going to protect all the oceans. We're just going to protect the oceans that directly um, affect us, the trade routes that affect us, and the trade routes that affect our uh, bilateral allies. And that's it. So that's, 
<laughs> that's essentially taking the whole monopoly game and putting all the pieces back in the box. And here we are today, and it's showing up in all sorts of different ways. But uh, the root cause is that the U.S. is not that interested in the rest of the world anymore, except certain allies. It's just, um, um, and and even at the height of the U.S. deal with the rest of the world, only 10% of the U.S. economy had anything to do with exports. Yeah. Yeah. So 90% is just Americans making stuff that other Americans. And there was a big price for it. It uh, decimated our workforces because offshore was uh, cheaper. Right. Uh, I, come, I come from Ohio and Ohio just got whacked, you know, in the uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, just got whacked because they were being outcompeted by Chinese labor. And um, so the U.S. is just kind of not interested anymore. Yeah. They're just not interested. It's 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 like, it's like Trump. I mean, Trump yesterday, people will vote the way they want to vote, but he may he voice what is a fundamental opinion that if you didn't contribute to your own defense, we're not going to defend you. Mm. Got to have some skin in the game. Yeah. Speak to the he's speaking to the Europeans. Well, did you pay for your defense? And they said, no. Well, will you still protect us? And he said, of course not. Yeah. Well, What's no, it- if you don't. If you're not up to defending yourself, we're not up to defending you. But that that would never be said. Sure. In prior times. So this is a huge whole, game changer. Like you and said, it, the monopoly pieces it, are back in the box. It's a whole new game. Yeah, it's a whole new game. And uh, so I'm a great fan of Peter Zion, um, you know, and his four books, which are amazing books. Um, the last uh, new book was... Uh, the end of the world is just the beginning. And I've read it seven times because it's so informative about what's going on in the world. So <clears throat> just to explain the great meltdown, I was saying, is there some common factor there in all this global change that would give entrepreneurs a direction on how to think about their uh, value creation in the marketplace? And I give it a period of 2020 to 2030. Yeah. 2050, 2020. Well, and and that's what I I want to 30 year period. Yeah. And I want to pause in the context of time, because like you said, you were born in 1944. I think about, you know, the internet reaching the mass consciousness of people in 1994. Here we are in 2024. You've got 80 years looking back. The internet is now 30 years looking back. But if I think about this, cycles of time 80 year cycles uh internet's 1994 1997 the fourth turning comes out uh with neil Hal. how much of this is playing back because in that context it was you know going all the way back to 2024 or, or 1944 1946 if you will then you go back so that was world war ii then you go back to the civil war then you go back to the american revolution i know in the the great meltdown you you touch on that too going all the way back to the founding of the united states why is that important for context thinking about the growth opportunities for community financial brands to help entrepreneurs yeah. level up and thrive yeah <clears throat> now we talked about this right at the beginning before we came on um uh, the U.S. is just uniquely different in the way it's constituted. And by constituted, I mean the Constitution. Yeah. And a lot of people don't really understand what the Constitution is. Uh, but my understanding is that it's a document that guarantees individualism. Mm. Okay? And you could see that in the first 10 amendments. They're all protections of individuals. And uh, so constitutions, for example, we have one here in Canada where our home base is. I'm an American citizen. I'm a Canadian citizen, so I have dual. And um, it, it, it doesn't have any reference to how it's protecting the individuals. Mm. Okay. So the U.S., the whole attitude is the constitution there is to actually protect individual Americans from their government. Yeah. From government overreach, from you know, um, you know, there there's things that the government does which you um, 
without being too political, are kind of totalitarian. Sure. And the only thing that protects people when it gets to the, you know, the final courts, the Supreme Court or Congress, is the fact that the Constitution makes individual initiative primary. So I think that uh, I just put in a phrase um, in the book and uh, in my notes to you before the presentation that it's the only entrepreneurial republic in the world. Yes. Okay. And uh, first of all, it's entrepreneurial. And, uh, you know, right in the first article of the Constitution are the the ruling on intellectual property. And I find that, I find that very, very interesting, the intellectual property that, uh, you know, we want to encourage and reward and support individual initiatives, especially in the area of inventing new knowledge and new techniques and new skills. So they spread throughout the country, you know. So that's what I think. And uh, there's uh, four constraints to that kind of growth. And it's the cost of money, which is primarily people experience through interest rates and mortgage rates. Okay. And number two is the cost of energy, which they experience at the gas pump and their heating bills. And uh, you're in Houston, so air conditioning bills. That's right. <laughs> and then the cost of labor, you know, um, uh, can you get good help? And how much does good help cost? And um, I'm talking entrepreneurially here. Right. And uh, cost of transportation. Um, to get stuff from here to there and for you to get from here to there, how much does it cost? And in all four of them, the U.S. is the cheapest most uh, low-priced melt melt country in the world, and it's because of the entrepreneurism. Well, and that's where I want to just pause for a minute because this idea of the great meltdown, it simplifies all of these, I would say, otherwise unpredictable changes as we look towards the future because we can look towards the future through two lenses. We can look to, towards the future as like it's getting bigger, it's expanding, it's it's full of opportunity, it's growing in abundance, or we can look at it through lack and limitation. Now, I'll tell you, we last year we launched our Future Growth Index with financial brand leaders, and their perspective of the future is a bit, shall we say, small. Entrepreneurs, on the other hand, are looking at this as a bit of a larger lens. How how does the great meltdown simplify all of these unpredictable <clears throat> changes up to 20, 2050? Well, I would say from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it has to do where should your innovation be focused? That's number one. And number two is where should your marketing efforts be focused? Uh, you know, innovation and marketing are the two profit centers in any entrepreneurial business. And uh, so, for example, I, I, you know, I've got um, pretty close relationships with people who are involved in the high tech field, you know, and they're coming out with this great new thing, this great new thing, this great new thing. And, um, and uh, how, how do you assess whether this has got a chance, this new thing? And uh, when I came upon the melt cost, I'd say, well, first of all, does... <laughs> Does it actually lower the cost of money? Let's say artificial intelligence, because it's a hot topic right yeah. now. Artificial intelligence. Well, does it take the um, cost of money down? Well, you can't tell because you don't know what it's being applied to. Sure. Okay. And I don't, I don't see any great breakthroughs that um, artificial intelligence is uh, you know, dropping the cost of money. Cost of energy, we know that it costs, uh, the cost of energy really goes up with artificial intelligence. It's a, it's a very voracious beast for the sucking byproduct. up energy. Yeah, sucking up. It takes yeah. a lot of energy to back up artificial intelligence. Labor, um, it's split so far. We know it doesn't affect blue color at all. Mm -hmm. And now we're getting the signs that it really affects highly educated white collar workers and it affects them in the way that it eliminates their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and I think the, the ball is out on that. And then the cost of, uh, transportation, I see no evidence one way or another about what it does. So people are so excited. Well, this changes everything. And I said, yeah, but what does it do to the cost of money, energy, labor, and transformation? transportation okay 
And I'll give you an idea of the cost of transportation that's changed in just basically the last two months, and it's the pirate attacks in the um, Straits of Hormuz, mm -hmm. which is uh, between the you know <clears throat> the Arabian Sea and uh, the Indian Ocean, yep. basically, it's where everything after that comes through the uh, comes through the Suez Canal. It has to go through this very narrow strait. You can see the coasts on both sides when you're going through, and they're being attacked. And within seven days after the first attack, the cost of insurance went up 300% if you're making that voyage. And 50% of the voyages immediately ceased, and they backed them out through the Mediterranean and around Africa, which is 24 more days. Uh, with uh, huge cost and fuel and everything else. That was just one incident, okay. I, I'm uh, glad you brought up AI because that is, like you said, it's kind of, it's going through a hype filter right now. November 30th, 2022, chat GPT hit the scene. Zero to 100 million users in two months. Fast, <laughs> you know, fast growing application. And then we had uh, Facebook threads, which was a flash in the pan. It beat that to zero to 100 million. But when we come back to this perspective of AI, I think the question is, what value is it really creating? Mm -hmm. um, and, and more specifically, working with these financial brand leaders, and, and even think about this through an entrepreneurial lens, I'm, I'm questioning, well, what's the most important technology that we need to master in the age of AI or as we navigate the great meltdown? And I keep coming back to, it's the technology that sits between your ears. It's the mind, it's the mindset that we have to uh, transform the, the chaos or the confusion into clarity and, and look for new opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, and I come back to this point of entrepreneurs and financial brand leaders are looking at the world through two different lenses. And I'm looking for opportunities to maybe find some common ground. When you think about the entrepreneurial mindset, navigating the complexity, quote unquote, of melt, but really looking into opportunities, where does the mind and mindset come into this to be aware, to be observant, to always be looking for ways to yeah. reduce melt? Yeah, for example, you know, I mean, um, well, I have a question to ask you before we go on to my thought here. And that the question is, when I just explained this formula, that the cost of these four things, um, and I did this months ago. I remember I just told you mm -hmm. that I was starting the book. Yeah. And uh, and uh, so did anything occur to you uh, just having those four things as sort of a lens? Well, it's easy to look through. It's a filter. It's, you know, is this going to reduce money cost? Is this going to reduce uh, the energy that's needed? And I think energy, too, is you can look at it through a different lens as well. It's not just, you know. Uh, cooling and heating it's also could be human energy um and i think about some of the work that mm -hmm. like kathy colby's doing um then you look at the is this going to reduce labor and i will tell you we've been able to apply some of that even here to get an exponential multiplier through technology and increase output even with the podcast and then there's the transportation so for me it's like okay check 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 am i getting is is this increasing or is this, is this de decreasing? And then where's the value creation within each one of those four lenses? Yeah. Yeah. And that's my intention of the book. And what's different about the book is that I'm talking about constant constraints. Yes. Okay. I'm not talking about, you know, great breakthrough opportunities. I'm just saying it doesn't matter what the opportunity seems to be. There's four constraints that it has to, uh, uh, decrease the cost and uh and it's very interesting i'm talking to you in houston right now and houston is like the sweet spot of the mm. planet related to melt costs yeah okay i mean if you think of houston uh cost of uh, money mm -hmm. well you're 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 now becoming the largest financial center west of the mississippi yes you know i mean and maybe you already were but Houston's just got so much going from it from a melt standpoint. Cost of money is very, very low. Um, relatively, I mean, comparatively, it's very low. 
uh, cost of energy. I mean, you're sitting in the energy center of of the, the world. The, US the energy is, corridor. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and most of the export money that goes out through the Gulf of Mexico, it goes out through uh, Houston Ship Channel. You know, yeah, the refineries are in Houston or they're, you know, on the Gulf Coast and everything. So the cost of energy is very low. I mean, Texas probably has the lowest energy cost mm -hmm. for the most part um, of any any place in the United States. And the U.S. is number one you know, low cost in the world. And then labor, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of... <laughs> I, I have a lot of clients on the Pacific Coast. You know, they're in California or Oregon and Washington. And, uh, you know, they're complaining about this and they're complaining about that. And I said, any thought that you might move to the United States? You know what I mean? What you think <laughs> about moving? I know a lot of Californians are moving to Texas and that's yes. about as American as you can get. You got a lot and coming then the to Hill Country. Transport, transportation costs. The U.S. just has so much great transportation because it's a, it's a coastal country, for mm -hmm. one thing. And that goes, that's on the west, that's on the south, that's on the east, and that's on the north. The Great Lakes go almost to the midpoint of the country, and that's all coastal. And that's got the greatest river systems in the world. And, um, you know, so this is a country that... Um, uh, Everything has got going for it is true uh, is proof that God loves America, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> everything just supports this country's growth. But from an entrepreneurial standpoint, you got to know that defeating the constraints is the key to entrepreneurial opportunity. And that's where playing a game of limiting constraints is always fun because it's like if we were to reduce say labor or if we wanted to reduce money or energy or transportation what's what do we have to do and then i think that's where what are you seeing when it comes to the most successful innovations that are going to be those that decrease all four of those maybe even perhaps at the same exact time lasting well we're, us we're using one of them right now that's true we are in real time no, I mean, Zoom was a great uh, game changer for us because we were strictly an in-person workshop. Uh, you know, all of our entrepreneurial workshops were in person. It was in Los Angeles. It was in Chicago, in Toronto, or in the UK, in London. And I mean, I, mean, uh, on, I remember on Friday the 13th, we had uh, Friday the 13th of March. Yep. We had a company, and two weeks later, we didn't have a company. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. And um, and all our all of our revenue disappeared. That great sucking sound you heard was our revenue <laughs> disappearing, and so we had to uh, make a very rapid switch to Zoom, uh, which in to praise them, they seem to be almost ready for that opportunity. Yeah. You know, and. Uh, Actually, actually, my most of my complaints about Zoom started about 30 days ago. <laughs> it, well, it's interesting when we look back because Zoom really had an exponential curve. I, personally, I started using Zoom back in 2017 because it was far superior at the time, say, to GoToMeeting or WebEx. Um, and then, you know, we saw we had the COVID experience. And I was asking and I asked these financial brand leaders when I do a workshop for banking on change, like, were you using Zoom before? How much has human behavior, if we think about changes at the macro level, technology driving a lot of this, driving changes in competition, driving changes in, in the consumer competitive landscape, the consumer consumer behavior landscape, even, even down to if I think about like Melt, I think about something as simple as Uber Eats. For example, I was doing a workshop yesterday and I said, how many of you were using like Uber Eats or DoorDash pre-pandemic? One, maybe two people. What about post pandemic? 95% of hands go up in the room and that's transportation right there. That's money. That's there's, there's energy tied to that. There's labor. So even thinking it through the context of that, that's an innovative opportunity of grocery mm -hmm. delivery, you know, looking yeah. at all of these different lenses. So melt is a fantastic lens to look through here from a yeah. constraint standpoint. Oh, one, one, and every individual has melt costs. Yeah. 
the cost of money. If you have a mortgage, that's the cost of money. If you're paying interest, you're, that's the cost of cost of money. And the other thing is the amount of hours you have to put in to get the money. That's one of the costs of costs of money, you know, mm. and, uh, and, um, you know, and uh, <clears throat> um, I, I estimate we have 130 team members and we had that when we went into COVID and we had that when we came out. And I was estimating one day, I was just thinking um, because they weren't commuting at all. And, uh, you know, the prices in Toronto and Chicago, uh, you know, in the UK and Los Angeles, I mean, they have to be living outside the city just to afford their housing and to get this kind of schools they want for their for their kids. And I estimate, you know, that they got back um, on average, they got about two hours times, they got about 440 hours back. Yeah. And that's equivalent. That's equivalent to, you know, it's a, it's a, it's equivalent, equivalent to how many weeks so they got, uh, you know, they got the, well, it's 40 hour a week. So they got the equivalent back of five weeks, mm -hmm. but then they had the cost of transportation, you know, they had the cost and they didn't have the cost of transportation. And we have, we come to a nice agreement after COVID of when you're in the office and when you're not. And uh, because we're back to live workshops and we have to have a team there and, uh, you know, it's everything. But they got a big bonus. Their cost of energy went down. Their cost of uh, transportation went down. <clears throat> and um, but you're you're referring to the banks. I don't know about the entrepreneurial banks there, you know, the private banks that are entrepreneurial. But I would say that most most corporations have not gained from virtual communication. From observing, we'll say, incumbent traditional financial brands to entrepreneurial, it's the entrepreneurial even to the point of, say, Jill Castilla, who's the CEO of Citizens Bank of Edmond out of Oklahoma, about a $350 million community institution. She has now launched a second brand, Roger.Bank, that is focused on the mil military community. So when you mm -hmm. think about this idea of value creation, what I don't think it would have been possible even a decade ago, five years ago, to launch a secondary brand alongside a community brand to create even more value for a particular niche community. You're touching on something here too when, when you're talking through your team and time. I, I've been thinking about this writing Banking on Change where time is like a currency. How are, we yeah. in, how are we investing our time? Because time should have a multiplier effect of being able to get something additional of value. An hour no longer, even this podcast conversation, it's 30 minutes to an hour of our time, but it's going to go on and be listened to a thousand times, a hundred thousand times oh, yeah. more. So yeah. it's interesting, this idea of context of time yeah. as a potential opportunity even for melt. Oh, yeah. That well, it's a cost, you know, time, time, effort. As uh, they're all costs. So my sense is these meld issues are not a new thing. They as soon as humans started <laughs> as a separate species, uh, they were aware of melt costs. Uh, you know, and uh, you know, and if they if they weren't intelligent about it, they just disappeared. Uh, you know, they just disappeared as individuals, as families and tribes. And uh, so it's constant melt, uh, melt cost, but it's very, very interesting that um, uh, of all the countries in the world, the U.S. for the longest time has always had the lowest melt cost. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, uh, it's 150 years now, and it's measured by the growth of the GDP. I mean, you can, you, you can make a direct correlation between melt costs and the growth of your GDP. Sure. And you can do that. You can do that on a company basis. You can do that on an individual basis. You are not growing financially and you're not profitably growing financially if you're not handling your melt costs. What are you excited about? I mean, when we're looking to this uh, 2050 horizon line, it, yeah. it, well, I'll be 106. And if I get to 2050, I'm feeling really great. Well, I mean, it, it feels far, but it, it's not. And and I know you're going to, I mean, because like you said, 1944 to 2024, you've got an eight decade perspective. You'll be mm -hmm. 106. So 
and, and, and I think that's that's something I've been thinking a lot about is as we think about Melt and this future horizon line, I hypothesize that how old you were, if you were even alive in 1994, is directly influencing your perspective of the world right now. In a recent workshop that we did, I said, okay, I want everyone who was not born in 1994, just go ahead and go stand in the back corner. Um, I want everyone who was 1 to 10 in 94, I want you to go stand in the other corner. Everyone who was 11 to 20, go stand in this corner. And then everyone who was 21 plus in 94, go stand in this corner. And it's funny because people think that, like, I'm separating, like, it's an ages. And I'm like, this has nothing to do about age. This has to do with about a matter of perspective. Because yeah. how old you were, even when talking with some of these bankers, I'm like, listen, what was, the, what was it like being 25 or 30 years old and this internet comes out? And I've heard you talk about the microchip. And that was a big transformative thought that you had even going back preceding 74 that was 50 years 74 ago. so yeah. so that's interesting so 74 to 94 that's 20 years 94 to 24 that's 30 years and then if we go back november 30th 2022 how old you were at that moment in time i think is going to directly influence this because i think about my kids and mm -hmm. and we're already using chat gpt to collaborate and, and co-create. And I think that's the thing because maybe there's a misconception and what's your take on this, thinking about Melt, thinking about these four lenses, that AI, some perceive, and I think incorrectly, or well, we're just gonna outsource our thinking to AI. I'm like, no, 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 no. I think, <laughs> I think there's an opportunity to double down on your thinking, to think even more and really, break because i look at those four cycles of operations uh or, or seasons if you will for growth there's a season to to learn to think to do and then to review i think a lot of individuals get stuck doing which is why i'm so grateful for just the coach experience because it's like every 90 days you get to pause you come out of the doing you get to review what you've done learn think about what you can do even next to do it even that much better so there's this whole cadence here but when we think about thinking, which I know you think a lot about metacognition, how does thought and just creating that space to just pause and review and reflect and learn and think help navigate this next period of melt? Yeah, well, I think the, the biggest thing is that um, uh, there are some barriers to thinking at all and thinking properly in these days just because of the sheer amount of electronic messaging that, that's mm. coming at you. So I made a very fundamental <laughs> melt decision uh, July of 2018. I decided not to watch any more television at all for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm um, halfway through year number six right now, and I haven't watched anything. I've never turned the TV on. And, um, you know, um, sometimes I'll catch something in a restaurant, you know, or, a, you know, walking through the lobby, walking through the lobby of a uh, airport. But the uh, thing I haven't, I got, and I freed up 800 hours a year for five years. Well, that's, that's a big gain. That's uh 4,000 hours. And yeah. it was because of simple behavior modification. And yeah. I think a lot of people, I don't have time. I don't have time. And my question is, is once again, how are you investing your time? What are you spending your energy on and what are you paying attention to? I think it's, that's directly going to influence your perspective. My experience here went back to 2004 when I read the four hour work week and um, I cut out news for the most part. Like I just stopped watching the news. I, and I still want to be informed, but it's looking at it through much more objective, critical lens and not getting so emotionally tied into the headline or whatever that thing is to pull down the perspective into more, maybe more of a negative. It's just maybe taking a, and I'll call it re-examining because your point about thinking, there's a lot more distraction yeah. re-examining yeah. the relationships that we have with devices and technology for that matter to begin with. Yeah. And I've never been on social media. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't know how to actually know how to get on social media. So you have who's. And, yeah. And um, although we use it as a broadcast medium, I mean, we do, yeah, we do X, we do, uh, you know, we, we, we do the mediums, but I treat it st st strictly as a broadcast medium. 
and uh, I know 20, 30 messages go out, you know, uh, all, almost daily with our team, but I don't, you know, I'm not really involved in that activity. And uh, it's funny, my cell phone, uh, I'm really hooked on URA, you know, URA yes. measures sleep. And um, I, I think it's been great experience in itself, and I get a lot of value out of the the application. But the biggest thing I do, it gives me a reason to have my cell phone charged up. I could go weeks with my cell phone not charged up. But I have layers of who's between me and anybody who wants to get in contact. And uh, I'm a great believer in having uh, um, really uh, specialized team members for almost everything that surrounds me. And that's, uh, you know, people say, I, I couldn't I couldn't do the cost of that. I mean, uh, how, how, I mean, what kind of payroll do you, what are your payroll costs? And I said, none. I said, it's all investment. That simple mindset shift right there is massive because think about your relationship with TV. You got five, was it four, 500 hours, 400 hours back, um, 500, no, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800, 800 hours over yeah. five years. It's a 40,000, uh, 4,000 uh, return on time our return on time. I think the same is true right here is yeah. it's just a little mental mindset shift of expense versus investment and investment comes back and pays a multiplier, uh, yeah. whether that's technology yeah. or time or, or, or whatnot. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to drop a thought here because I know there's going to be people watching this and this may be their business, but if you had a platform right now and use AI, if you need to, or use anything else you need to use, but it's a platform that just gives you a daily read of melt costs. And um, you could look at any business opportunity. And the first thing you do, do before you talk about the marketplace and who's the consumer, you say, this thing that I've just created, how does it lower money costs? How does it lower energy, labor, mm. and transportation costs? I think that would be a neat app. I think it would be. It's a, it's a, once again, it's a, it's a very compelling offer because everybody relates to those costs. And it's, I, I like the compelling offer versus a convincing argument perspective that you've shared before. And this is where melt. When you ask me, what did I think? It's four things. It's easy to remember. It's an acronym and and acronyms are abundant in digital growth topia because it's the only way that this ADD mind can actually remember. I have to associate different things to different words as, as we start to wrap up here, when we think about melt, money, energy, labor, technology, looking Trans for transportation, tra transportation, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> what, what can we do next to continuously be aware? Your idea here of, of a platform makes a ton of sense to me, but what's something practical that we can continue to do as we move forward to this 2050 horizon line when we celebrate your 106th birthday? Yeah, well, I mean, simple one. This is this is pretty basic. Is um, um, do you have savings or are you in debt? <laughs> mm -hmm. If you're in debt, uh, your mel your money costs are going to be higher than if you're you have savings, or you know, I mean, is more coming in than is going out, and uh, uh, anything, and uh, um, you know, uh, just look at uh, what are you writing checks for right now that uh, you could uh, you could eliminate. So I think you, anybody with a little bit of thought can probably get leaner in their spending, and they any any entrepreneur can probably with any thought get um, you know get richer in terms of their revenues. Yes, you know? and. Uh, but I think that you know it's kind of lear learning the ABCs. You know, I mean, once you once you have the structure of it, uh, you become more alert about things. You become more curious. You become more responsive. You become more resourceful. And I think um, if it starts at the individual level, and then it's the family level, and then the community level, and up, uh, that's that's where transformations happen in the United States. They happen from the bottom up. They don't happen from the down. You know. And, uh, and, you know, um, I've got a U.S. senator who is a coach member because he's got an entrepreneurial company at the same time. And I'm going to send him to this. And I said, you know, um, you know, um, 
this would be an interesting lens to look at the cost of any program, to look at the cost of, you know, what are the money, you know, money, energy, labor, and transportation costs? I mean, is it good? Is it bad? You know, yeah. whatever. But I think it just gives people a, an immediate upfront, um, self-evident truth type of approach to what's going on in the world. And uh, and the other thing is, if you're looking at happenings in the world, you mentioned news. Um, the only thing that's really important about where the United States is going is are its melt costs. Yeah. Uh, China's melt costs are going through the roof right now. Mm -hmm. Russia, Russia's melt costs are going through the roof. You know, Canada has much worse melt costs than the United States does. Well, I know Peter has yeah. a, Peter Peter Zion has an interesting perspective on on China um, and what's going on over there and how that <laughs> is going to implicate things going forward into the future to your point that the increasing yeah. milk cost, but there's one thing that you, you shared that I just want to surface back up. It's the curiosity component. Um, yeah. It's easy. I think when things are getting more complex to kind of just shut down and go inwards, but be that curious kindergarten. I always tell my kids, I don't care how old you get, be, be the curious kindergartner that you used to be because you're always going to be learning and seeing things from a different perspective. Um, and if you're learning, you're going to be growing. Uh, so this has been such a good conversation here talking about uh, <clears throat> the, the the great meltdown and, and what we can do to be curious, to be aware, to be alert, to be responsive so that we can continue to create value for others together, Dan. Thank you. Yeah, well, um, I'd like to, you know, just uh, because it's a real gift uh, to me that you have me on your podcast. So I'm just going to give you the download of the book and you can put it on right after here and anybody wants to download it, they can get the electronic version of the book. I mean, these type of books I do just to support the entrepreneurs in our program. I mean, we write big books for, you know, other reasons, but this, this one. So well, that's such a, uh, a kind yeah, gift. actually, actually the hard copy just comes out next week. So we, but we have it and, uh, Gord will send this on to you. He'll just send the, um, um, you'll just send the download and you go to the download site and it's the download of the book. It's the download of the audio and it's the download of the video. Uh, all, all three things come with the same and it's just, uh, my appreciation to you for having me, you know, kind of communicate and put this idea out into the public. Well, it is a simple one. Simple is good. I like it. It connects. It sticks. It, it resonates with me. And if you want to get the book, www.strategiccoach.com forward slash go forward slash T G M as in T D G great M meltdown. So go yeah. grab a copy. You can download it. You can listen to it. Dan, thanks again for joining me for another episode of the banking on digital growth podcast. This has been a lot of fun as always. Thank you. Thank you. As always, and until next time, be well, do good, be the light.